Thank you for all of you for your commitment for showing up to the morning panel at the second day of the conference. Um, I'm going to be picking up on um, two of the threads that Susan mentioned yesterday, theory, a little bit on pedagogy, and then I want to um, talk a bit about voice as well, which emerged in our discussion yesterday. The publication of Rape and Antiquity 20 years ago brought scholarly attention to an underexplored but pervasive topic in ancient literature and art. Broaching this topic in a nuanced and sensitive way is absolutely essential, especially in the classroom, where, at least in the US, odds are that one in four students in any given class have personally experienced sexual violence. My paper today is inspired by my mythology student's conviction that Cassandra's description of her visions in Aeschylus' Agamemnon, and especially her alienation from friends and family, mirror their understanding and experience of trauma after sexual assault. Following my student's lead, this paper asks, how can modern perspectives on trauma reframe research on rape and antiquity by calling attention to the victim's experience of sexual violence? The perspective of the victim is often difficult to identify in ancient depictions of rape, since ancient sources often silence or obscure this perspective, as Karen Pierce, for example, demonstrated in her essay on new comedy in Rape and Antiquity. I hope to show today that a reading practice informed by trauma theory can recover aspects of the text that are obscured but still present, such as the victim's experience of sexual violence as a traumatic bodily experience with lasting effects on the psyche and on relational life. Drawing on the narrative songs of two victims of sexual violence and tragedy as case studies, I contend that trauma theory offers a framework for recognizing and elucidating the victim's experience of rape as articulated in narrative. Trauma theory shows that trauma shapes narrative in unexpected, sometimes oblique ways. In a modern context, the incoherence and non-linearity of traumatic memories create problems for victims who must give a detailed linear account of the event to police or in front of a court. Listeners demand coherence from victims in order to believe and sympathize with them. Yet trauma resists coherence and linearity, and victims require the support of their community in order to reconstruct a coherent narrative in the face of an experience that has shattered their understanding of self and their connections with others. The kinds of narratives that communities demand from victims and the kinds of narratives that victims can at first offer are often at odds. This disconnect between community and victim is exemplified by my first case study, Cassandra, who recounts being disowned by her community at, in Aeschylus' Agamemnon. Creusa in Euripides' Ion, whose community has not disowned her, provides a salient point of contrast. She can construct a coherent narrative of her rape that elicits the belief of both the internal audience and of most modern scholars. Modern readers of Cassandra's rape narrative must not seek coherence from a trauma narrative that actively resists it. By demanding coherence from Cassandra's account of her assault by Apollo, we risk reinforcing modern myths of the perfect victim, thereby reenacting the disbelief of the chorus and of Cassandra's community at Troy. In my time today, I'd like to trace some of the contributions of trauma research to an understanding of the way that trauma shapes and is shaped by narrative. Then I'll analyze in detail Cassandra's Kamos and Agamemnon, briefly contrasting it with Creusa's Monody in Ion. In my brief discussion of trauma theory today, I'd like to focus on two findings of trauma research. First, that traumatic memories resist organization into narrative. And second, that trauma shatters the survivor's understanding of herself and her connections with others. Because traumatic experience cannot be fully understood when it occurs, traumatic memories have qualities distinct from other memories. Feminist psychiatrist Judith Herman describes traumatic memories as follows. Quote, they are not encoded like the ordinary memories of adults in a verbal linear narrative that is assimilated into an ongoing life story. Instead, traumatic memories are frozen, wordless, without context, imprinted on the mind as vivid sensations and images. In Cassandra's Kamos, I argue, 
Vivid traumatic memories, disjointed in space and time, haunt her. In addition to the challenge that trauma poses to a survivor's understanding of herself, her ability to record her life in stories, trauma changes the survivor's relationship with her community, often for the worse. Judith Herman writes, quote, the damage to relational life is not a secondary effect of trauma as originally thought. Traumatic events have primary effects not only on the psychological structures of the self, but also on the systems of attachment and meaning that link individual and community. Cassandra's song depicts the harrowing effects of trauma on her relational life. Crayusa, by contrast, receives a markedly different reception for her rape narrative from friends and family on stage and from modern scholars. The coherence of her rape narrative, coupled with her high status as queen of Athens, occasions this warm reception. Traumatic experience presents unique challenges for narrators and for audiences. Since trauma is by its nature unspeakable, unassimilated, understood not when it occurs, but rather only belatedly. Cassandra's song is marked not by simple knowledge of an event, but by trauma that, in the words of trauma theorist Kathy Carruth, simultaneously defies and demands our witness. The narratives of both Cassandra and Creusa demonstrate the long-lasting effects of violence on these mythological women, but they pose two different scenarios for the, for the damage that trauma can do to relational life as the audience rejects or bears witness to the victim's trauma. Cassandra's prophetic utterances in Aeschylus's Agamemnon exemplify the ways that traumatic memories resist narrative context but recur repeatedly. Cassandra describes an unrelenting series of vivid sense perceptions that collapse temporal and spatial distinctions. In passage one on the handout, for example, Cassandra calls as her witnesses, quote, these babies here weeping for slaughters and roasted flesh eaten by their father. She connects these vivid sights, sounds, and smells of past trauma in the house of Atreus with a fresh agony, which has not yet taken place, the murder of Agamemnon in the bath. In addition to temporal distinctions, Cassandra's Kamas also collapses spatial distinctions between Troy, Argos, and Hades. She links, for example, the sacrifices her father made before the walls of Troy, which were ineffective in protecting the city, with her own impending murder, both events marked by a flow of warm blood to the ground. From Troy to Argos to Hades, from past to present to future, Cassandra's song resists a linear narrative context, blending her personal traumatic experiences at Troy with the traumatic past of the house of Atreus and linking these past traumas with both her and Agamemnon's impending murder. Moreover, Cassandra repeatedly re-experiences the same visions, even in the space of her 258-line performance on stage. In passage two on the handout, I've included an outline of this episode, that highlights Cassandra's repetition of the murders of Thyestes' children and the murders of herself and Agamemnon. In their second iteration at lines 1214 to 1241, Cassandra more cogently argues that these past and future murders are causally linked, testifying to the inevitable repetition inherent in traumatic experience. I want to spend the next few minutes performing a close reading both of Cassandra's account of her encounter with Apollo and of critics' responses to that narrative, because this passage forms the crux of Cassandra's experience of trauma, and this is passage three on the handout. Cassandra does not give a linear account of rape or any other act of violence in her kamas. Instead, vivid images, smells, and sounds of past and future violence flood her against her will, so that the chorus characterizes her as divinely possessed, theophoretos, and asks where these divinely possessed miseries come from. In response, Cassandra names Apollo, the god of prophecy. Her exchange with the chorus about her encounter with Apollo suggests that her visions are rooted in a past experience of sexual violence. I don't have time to read this exchange in English, but it's in passage three, and I'll paraphrase it a little bit. Cassandra's reluctance to speak in her obscure account testify to the unassimilated quality of her trauma. She has never told this story before because she was too ashamed. Moreover, 
the event itself remains unclear, both to her and to her audience. In order to clarify what precisely happened, the chorus asks, in unusually direct language, if she came together with Apollo in the act of procreation. Cassandra replies with a non sequitur, after I consented, I deceived Loxias. This response is also obscure. To what did Cassandra consent, and how did she deceive him? Scholarly attempts to make sense of these lines result in textual emendations to resolve irregularities. You can see in the Apparatus Criticus beneath pa passage three that lines 1203 and 1204 have been transposed, while Namo in line 1207 has been emended to Hamu. In addition, attempts to explain or paraphrase this passage inherit Cassandra's incoherence. I'll focus on Frankel's characteristically sensitive attempt to explain these lines, and this is passage four on the handout. He writes, the use of palai ain and palai stais makes it beyond doubt that Apollo did not, in a metaphorical sense, contend for her heart or her favor, but actually wrestled with her. The god sets himself to overpower the maiden, who feels and acts like a true maiden. Then she agrees, and that brings the physical wrestling to an end. Later, she breaks her promise. But from the beginning, it is not merely br brute force which is here at work. With all her resisting, Cassandra is susceptible to the power of the god's charis. For all that, she withdraws before the consummation. How that could be, the poet does not reveal. Frankel's account poses new difficulties. I could examine his interesting phrase, who feels and acts like a true maiden, or his reference to a promise, but instead I'll focus on the word withdraws. Does he mean that she emotionally withdraws by refusing Apollo's advances, or does he imply a physical withdrawal during sexual inter intercourse? How does a mortal woman physically withdraw from a god? The temporal sequence of Frankel's account and causal relationships are also unclear. He indicates that Cassandra was assaulted, overpowered, in his words, with physical wrestling, which she resists. But how exactly does the god's charis work? Does it prompt her consent, which she, which she later retracts? Were there two encounters with the god, or just one? Frankel's explanation testifies to the impossibility of creating a coherent narrative from this brief and obscure account of Cassandra. Scholars inherit Cassandra's incoherence in their attempts to impose a coherent narrative upon her experience. Yet the incoherence of the text cannot be resolved. It is a symptom of a traumatic memory that Cassandra has not assimilated, does not fully grasp, and therefore cannot recount. The chorus asks her for facts, but she does not give the facts, offering instead a glimpse of her feelings, shame for example, and a vivid snapshot of unclear actions combined with retrospective self-judgment. Because her narrative is obscure, both the chorus and many modern scholars question whether Apollo actually assaulted Cassandra. Most recently, Paula Debner has argued that Cassandra is presented as a virgin in this play, connecting her with other prominent virgins in the Oresteia trilogy. My interest, however, is less in defining her sexual status than in the ways that her narrative encodes trauma. Instead of a coherent narrative, we should expect an obscure account like this one from a victim of sexual violence, who is telling her story for the first time and who expects her audience not to believe her. Moreover, traces of Cassandra's experience of this violent encounter emerge at other moments in the text, which performs the victim's experience of trauma as recurring terror that returns unbidden. Apollo's punishment of Cassandra with violent visions repeats the violence of that initial obscure event. The chorus twice describes Cassandra's visions as violent attacks by a god. In passage 5a on the handout, they ask, from where do you get the divinely inspired futile pains that rush upon you? The word episutus recalls the hostile attacks of Iliadic warriors, alluding also perhaps to the assault by Ajax that Cassandra suffered at Troy. Likewise, in 5b, the chorus remarks, some divinity that wishes you ill, attacking you very heavily, makes you sing of mournful death-bringing sufferings. The language here is even more clear, characterizing the visions as an overwhelming, hostile attack. 
Moreover, Cassandra herself characterizes her visions as painful natural disasters, winds and fires that rush upon her, unsummoned and uncontrollable. These are passages 5C and 5D on the handout. The violent onset of these visions reenacts the initial assault of the god upon his victim. Most telling of all is the damage to Cassandra's relational life that her encounter with the god causes. Cassandra's prophecies alienate her from friends and from the chorus, who do not believe her about anything that happened or will happen. In passage six on the handout, Cassandra describes how her friends at Troy mocked her like enemies, and she wandered alone, an outcast from society, cut off from her friends and family because of her prophecies. As Judith Herman has shown, this damage to relational life is not a secondary but a primary effect of trauma. Cassandra's violent visions alienate her from loved ones who cannot or do not wish to understand her suffering. Yet more than anything, Cassandra demands this understanding. Three times, and this is passage seven on the handout, she calls upon the chorus to bear witness to her knowledge, both of past traumas and of future ones. This is the central paradox of trauma. Traumatic experience both defies understanding and demands it, challenging both the survivor and those in whom she confides to claim its awful truth. In closing, and don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about Ion very long because I don't have very much time, um, but I want to turn to Euripides' Ion, which self-consciously reworks many of the themes and plot elements of Aeschylus' Oresteia. Adele Scafuro has argued that Euripides' Ion is unique in Greek tragedy for its inclusion of a female discourse on sexual violence. Unlike Cassandra's song, Creuse's monody places the traumatic event within a cohesive narrative with beginning, middle, and end. I don't have time today to analyze in detail this song, but I'd like to point out that this song also receives a strikingly different reception from its internal audience, the old man and chorus. In passage 8a on the handout, the old man calls Creusa his daughter in response to her song, asks Creusa to take him back to the beginning and to repeat the story step by step. As they walk through her story in detail again, the old man expresses sympathy with her, the victim, by characterizing Apollo as kakos in passage 8b, and by covering his head and weeping on her behalf in passage 8c. Creusa, unlike Cassandra, narrates a coherent story of the assault and finds a receptive audience to bear witness to it. Moreover, the ending of Ion restores the relational life that had been disrupted by the assault. Creusa is reunited with her son and returns to Athens with him and her husband, Zuthus. The ending of this play is ambivalent, as Creusa must also assent to future silence about her past trauma as a condition of her happy reunion with Ion and her husband. Nonetheless, Creusa's monody and its reception provide a striking contrast to the Cassandra narrative by illuminating the standards that witnesses demand of rape narratives, coherence, a beginning, middle, and end, emotion, but not so much that it obscures the sequence of events. Scholarly reception of these two stories risks falling into the same patterns as their internal audiences do, discounting Cassandra while believing Creusa. I hope to have shown today that both stories are marked by the speaker's past experience of trauma. Cassandra's narrative is shaped by trauma, while Creusa uses narrative to make sense of her past traumatic experience and to intervene in her relationships with others. Finally, I want to end by acknowledging the impact that our reception of these ancient stories can have on students. By believing Creusa's account of violence and discounting Cassandra's, we risk perpetuating the modern myth of the perfect victim that compels so many victims of sexual violence to remain silent even today. Thank you. Thank you.